Hey guys, it's Nicole. Welcome back to my channel. Today I wanted to do a follow-up video to the last one I did about dairy and my favorite dairy-free alternatives that I buy. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about why I don't eat dairy products, why I think they're not very good for humans, and also where I get my calcium. When you consume too much sodium, the body tries to get rid of it through the urine, but it takes calcium with it which depletes calcium stores in the body. High levels of calcium in the urine lead to the development of kidney stones and at the same time inadequate levels of calcium in the body lead to thin bones and osteoporosis. There are also some substances that hinder the absorption of calcium. Those are oxalates, phytates, fiber, high amounts of sodium, like I said before, and then also too much phosphorus. And caffeine, as well, leaches calcium from the bones, so be careful with coffee and too much chocolate and things like that. Many health experts and those who are pro-dairy claim that because plant foods contain oxalates, phytates, and fiber, they aren't good sources of calcium because these substances block calcium absorption. But, for example, bok choy actually has 54% calcium absorption rate and broccoli has a whopping 61% absorption rate, while milk only has a 32% absorption rate. Now remember that spinach, on the other hand, has only a 5% absorption rate, which is really poor, so don't rely on spinach for calcium. Spinach is wonderful for things like vitamin K and other um, nutrients like vitamin A and fiber, but don't rely on it for calcium. So even though it's true that oxalates and phytates and fiber hinder the absorption of calcium, it's it can't really be that bad considering broccoli contains oxalates but has a better absorption rate than milk. So other things that, other foods that contain calcium and have a better absorption rate than milk would be things like kale, um, almonds have a 21% calcium absorption rate, uh, sesame seeds also 21%, white beans 22%, tofu has a 31% absorption rate which are lower than milk, but it's you know still pretty good. If, if you were to have three ounces of tofu, let's say, that's 320 milligrams of calcium. That means you're gonna absorb 100 milligrams of calcium. Now, if you have a cup of milk, that has 300 milligrams of calcium, which is actually less than the tofu, and, it, and you're only absorbing 96 milligrams of that calcium. And then another, in another example, um, if you eat about a cup of bok choy, you're getting 86 milligrams that are absorbed, whereas a cup of milk or yogurt, you're only getting, you're getting about 96 milligrams absorbed, which is almost the same amount. So that's why it's important to eat lots of these different vegetables, not just for the calcium, of course, but for the other, you know, micronutrients and macronutrients like uh, you know, vitamin A and B vitamins and fiber. Okay, so one of the problems that I have with milk is that it's a very highly allergenic food. Many people are, are lactose intolerant and dairy products in general have been linked to things like eczema, acne, asthma, and other allergies. My son actually had horrible eczema as a baby and young child and now he doesn't eat any dairy products. He did then and he doesn't have any eczema on his skin at all. And for the record, neither of my children have acne. I've got an 18-year-old daughter and a 15-year-old son, and they've never had problems with acne. Now, as a teenager, I would drink milk like it was going out of style. I mean, I would go to the fridge and just drink it from the gallon. It was kind of gross, but I loved it. I love milk. Um, of course, I don't drink it anymore, but as a teenager, I, I downed a lot of milk, and I had really bad acne and my brother actually had it much worse than me. It was really bad and very embarrassing and hard to deal with, as if any of you know what it's like when you're a teenager and dealing with acne, it's very embarrassing. But my kids, neither of them have, have acne and they don't you know, eat dairy products at all. And I know, of course, these are anecdotal cases, but I've seen other people clear up their acne when they stop eating dairy products. I, I tend to think that there is a correlation there. So the other problem is, you know, dairy products are linked to different types of diseases. 
Unfortunately, cows are given antibiotics injected with a genetically engineered form of bovine growth hormone, RBGH, which is a synthetic hormone used to artificially increase milk production. RBGH also increases blood levels of the insulin growth factor, IGF-1, in those who drink it, and higher levels of this IGF-1 are linked to several cancers. The National Institutes of Health website shows a study that shows that consumption of dairy products, particularly at age 20, was associated with an increased risk of hip fracture in old age. And then in a Harvard study of male health professionals, men who drank two or more glasses of milk a day were almost twice as likely to develop advanced prostate cancer as those who didn't drink milk at all. A recent pooled analysis of 12 prospective cohort studies, which included more than 500,000 women, found that women with high intakes of lactose from foods such as milk had a higher risk of ovarian cancer. Now, I don't really like to eat fortified foods. A lot of people say if you're low in calcium, you're not eating dairy products, you should eat, you know, foods that are fortified with calcium. I don't really agree with this. A study was done at the National Institutes of Health where they studied 5,448 adults free of clinically diagnosed cardiovascular disease. They noted that calcium supplement use was associated with an increased risk for incident of coronary artery calcification. Intake of calcium from food sources has not been shown to increase risk. Basically, all that calcium was just not getting absorbed and it accumulated in the arteries as calcified plaque. However, if you pair calcium with vitamin K2, which is not normally found in the diet of you know, typical people here in the US, this K2 helps to shuttle the calcium to the bones. In the bones, vitamin K2 activates a specific protein called osteocalcin. When this osteocalcin is activated by vitamin K2, it binds calcium with bone minerals, which strengthen them, instead of all that calcium accumulating in the arteries, causing arterial plaque and then increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now I'm not talking about plain old vitamin K. You're probably thinking of, you know, vitamin K that's found in leafy greens and other vegetables and, uh, you know, other foods like that. I'm talking about vitamin K2, which is not easily found in the diet. It's found in things like natto, which is a fermented soy product that does not taste that great, and also in small amounts in pasture-raised eggs, milk, and butter. I don't eat dairy products, obviously, and I also don't really want to eat natto every day because it tastes pretty nasty. So if you're going to take a calcium supplement, you really should find one that has vitamin K2 in it. But I like to get calcium from food because it's better absorbed. Sometimes I take a calcium supplement with K2 if I see that at the end of the day I didn't get enough calcium that day, but for the most part I really try to get most if not all of my calcium from food. I found that calcium is the one nutrient that I always seem to fall short on. So I really have to pay attention to how much I'm getting in my diet. So another way of building strong bones that doesn't have anything to do with diet is to strength train or lift weights. I try to lift weights about three times a week. And what's interesting is that in countries such as Japan, India and Peru, where the average daily calcium intake is as low as 300 milligrams per day, the incidence of bone fracture is actually quite low. So this idea that we need to load up on calcium seems to be a myth when you look at other countries' calcium intake. But if you're still concerned about getting enough in your diet, here's a typical day of eating without any fortified foods or a ton of tofu because nobody wants to eat pounds of tofu every single day just to meet their calcium needs. So for breakfast I would start with a cacao carob smoothie. Carob actually has a decent amount of calcium in it. And then this uh, smoothie that includes, you know, banana and um, just a little bit of soy milk that's not fortified, um, it, it has about 85 milligrams of calcium. And so for a snack I would do a chia pudding and three tablespoons of chia seeds has over 300 milligrams of calcium in it. And then if you top that with a couple tablespoons of almonds, that's another 50 milligrams of calcium. And then for lunch, if you have like a kale salad with some avocado and tomato and cucumbers, and then I like to top it with sesame seeds and make sure that they're unhulled. The unhulled sesame seeds are much, much higher in calcium than the hulled type of sesame seeds. So you can just sprinkle that on the top of the salad and then make some sort of a vegan dressing 
out of cashews or you know avocado or oil and vinegar whatever you'd like to do and then for a snack I'll have like an apple with three figs figs are actually pretty high in calcium and that's a, that'll give me about 52 milligrams of calcium and then for dinner let's say I'll make a vegan chili with beans and corn and tomato and all that kind of good stuff. And one serving of that will be about 225 milligrams of calcium. And then later on, maybe I'll have a snack of some papaya and that has about 35 milligrams. So total for the day, after eating all that, is 992 milligrams of calcium. So that's actually really good without eating any tofu or any fortified foods or any calcium supplements. And then also, I really enjoy drinking nettle infusions. Nettle, when you make it into an infusion, and the difference between an infusion and tea is that, well, first of all, infusions aren't tea. It's not the same thing. When someone says, I'm making herbal tea, there's no such thing as herbal tea. When you say herbal tea, that doesn't really make any sense because tea is a specific type of herb. So if you say, I'm making peppermint herb tea or peppermint tea, that doesn't make any sense. It's, it's Peppermint isn't tea. It's a completely separate herb. So when you're making any type of tea or infusion with any other type of herb other than tea, you're making an infusion. You're not making tea. Tea is made with tea. It's not made with herbs, even though tea is an herb. But anyway, I don't want to get off on a tangent. So nettle infusions are the difference between the two. So the difference is when you make tea, usually you steep it for like 10 minutes or five minutes. But with an infusion of a specific type of herb, you wanna let it steep for a minimum of four hours, sometimes even overnight. So when you make a nettle infusion and it steeps for four hours or more, that cup of infusion tea, <laughs> I don't wanna call it tea, but anyway, that infusion, that cup of infusion can have maybe 500 milligrams of calcium in it. It's very hard to tell. You'd have to take it to a lab and get it tested, you know, for how much calcium is in it. But from what I have learned throughout all of my, um, you know, education on herbs, nettle is very high in calcium. It's actually high in a bunch of different vitamins and minerals. It's almost like taking a full multivitamin when you drink a cup of nettle infusion. So include that in your diet. It's really easy to make. It's really yummy and satisfying and very mild tasting. It's not bitter at all. So that concludes the video. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section and give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And if you would like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I would really appreciate it. And I so appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. And I'll see you next time.